Hello everyone, this is Jenny from the Narrate team. Following our Christmas Eve gatherings, Narrate has started a series titled Merge, a conversation on balancing willfulness with being surrendered. This week, Adam asked the question, what could be the impact of differentiating effort from outcome? Hey, good morning. It's great, great to be with you. Only 12 weeks till Easter. Just saying. So if I can, speaking back to Christmas Eve, to, to me, the, the best and brightest part of that whole experience was to see the high level of pride and enthusiasm of the hundred plus of you who helped us make that possible. And whether, whether it be at eight o'clock in the morning setting up or eight o'clock at night tearing down or checking kids in or holding babies in the nursery or singing in the band or ushering or greeting, I just couldn't help but notice uh, that like all of you had these like nerdy smiles on your face and we're, we're kind of a somber kind of stared our shoes bunch, but you guys were just glowing. And to, to me, that, that was what stood out was just how, uh, dare I say, how proud you were and, and how excited you were to, to serve the community in that way. And so thank you so much. It goes all the way back to the summer when we started wrestling with this idea of, wait a minute, we think we could probably serve more people on Christmas Eve. And, and that turned out to be true. We served about twice as many people this year to, to last. But, but we also knew that there was a problem there. And that was that asking people to, to give up in some cases, five, six, seven hours, sometimes more if you're in the band uh, to serve people on Christmas Eve, like that's a tall ask. Uh, you know, may, maybe Christmas Day is the only other day of the whole year that's more spoken for than Christmas Eve. And so that, that you guys turned up and did it with so much enthusiasm is just a reminder to me that we set out to start a church and, and to be a church that said, uh, let's, not have, let's not have members, let's have owners. And let's identify with people who really buy into the vision of, of knowing God by getting our hands dirty and, and serving God by serving people. And it, to me, it was an astounding, astounding reminder of just what incredible people. It, it was so humbling for me to look around and go like, oh, yeah, that person does that and that person does that. And there they are being silly with kids on the stage. And there they are ushering. And so way to go. And thank you guys so much. And it was an absolute thrill to serve with you. And for those of you that maybe, maybe this is your first time to a, a Sunday at the Grand Street, maybe Sunday or Christmas Eve at the Civic Center was your first experience with us. Uh, we're thrilled that you're here. Uh, this morning, we're going to start, as we said on Christmas Eve, we're going to start a brand new series. But I just want to take a moment to talk about what we do and don't mean by this idea of series. Uh, we, we, we call them series, but you'll hear us call them conversations interchangeably. And that's, that's sincere on my and our part. Uh, we... We, we, we don't ever, I don't ever want to have the last word on a subject. And it's not that I don't have firm convictions and beliefs. It's that I'm not sure that that's really the pressing issue here. I think it's like, what, what, are, what are yours? And so what, what I want to do is what we want to do is start conversations, uh, to, to ask questions and raise issues and point to ideas and, and look at scriptures that cause us to wonder and, and to talk. And for, for me, the win is you leaving here and having conversations with your spouse and your, your kids and your friends and your coworkers. For me, the win is you leaving here and, and disagreeing and having reasons as to why and agreeing and having questions as to why you'd need to learn more. Like for, for us, this is a very sincere effort to go, let's get people talking. Because quite frankly, the ideas that really form and shape us are the ones that we own by our own process. And furthermore, we, we embrace the idea that we don't learn anything out of the context of relationship. And so to just pummel you with truths without relationship is just, uh, well, it's, it's a waste of our time. So all of that to say, we're thrilled that you're here if you're a guest. We're thrilled that you're here if you're not a guest. And we're going to start this series called Merge. And by way of quick reminder, the reason we started this series on Christmas Eve is because at the very center of the idea of merge, uh, or excuse me, at the very center of Christmas Eve is this idea of merge. Because on Christmas Eve, uh, what we celebrate and what we talk about are these two young, ambitious leaders who had strong designs on their future, strong opinions about who God is and how he was going to work in their life. They had businesses, so to speak, they wanted to run and houses they wanted to build and kids they wanted to have and places they wanted to go. They had a strong opinion about their future and how God would get them there. Like they, they, they were ambitious, they, they may be idealistic, but that was them. But then it happened. There was an interruption. There was a disruption. Something entirely outside of their control, especially for Joseph. Joseph is the first guy in the world who ever got to say, I don't know why she's pregnant. And it was true. Like, <laughs> we, we, we pulled that one out of Christmas Eve. I think it might have been too risky. But, but, but seriously, like, and, and Mary, she, she got the chance to say yes, but kind of. 
Like they, they're, their story is so much like ours in that they had plans, they had desires, they had ambitions, they had direction, they had a future that they were pointed towards and God was with them and then there was this thing outside of their control that happened and they had to deal. And I know, I know the scriptures can be so controversial in 21st century America. The thing that gives me confidence in them and what Paul says about them being true and that is quite simply that they help us know God and know him well is the fact that 2,000 years removed from even the most recent pieces of scripture in here, the most recent writings, the most recent letters, the most recent lives, we, we run into narratives that are so similar to ours. People asking why suffering, people asking how do we celebrate well, people, people asking who is the divine and what is he like and what does he expect of us. And Mary and Joseph's story reminds us that their stories are our stories. You had designs, you had ambitions, you got married, you had kids, you got a job, you got a degree, you were headed somewhere. And then it happened. She lied. There was a diagnosis. There was a car wreck. Something outside of your control happened. And so really what we're asking in this series is, is what if thriving, healthy people merge? Like what if thriving, healthy people, it's not about not having a will. It's not about not having an ambition. It's not about celebrating, becoming these apathetic people who don't ever want anything. It's about understanding that thriving people, they know how to have plans and they know how to surrender those plans. They're willing to do the emotionally exhausting part of life that calls really wanting your business to go somewhere and then really adjusting when it doesn't. See, the part of the Mary and Joseph story we know, of course, it's the baby Jesus part. It's that they got to give birth to the Messiah. It, it's the part where, where, where this Jesus, who I believe died for our sins and on the third day walked out of the tomb alive, and because of him, we get a whole new different set of options. Not heaven later, heaven now and forever. That's the part we know. And yet what we're exploring is the fact that like that was born of a lot of agony and a lot of disappointment, a lot of suffering, and a lot of merging. And so for the month of January, really the question we want to ask is just simply, how do we do that? Like, I'm, I've already kind of passed posing it as the ideal. The question becomes, how do we actually become the kinds of people who are capable of merging? How do we actually become the kinds of people who thrive through life, who have plans and deal with disappointments and, and follow God into that process? You know, Dallas Willard points out that Maybe, maybe the most important thing of, or in, in my mind, one of the most important things Jesus ever said we find in Matthew 7. And it's where Jesus says that if we follow him, we can have the kind of life that can endure any and all storms. L listen in, in Matthew 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. You're already singing the song, right? The wise man built his... The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. I think the question we're asking is, is it true that Jesus can give us the kind of life in which we can merge any two set of circumstances? Not where we go looking for tragedy, but where we know that God can give us the kind of life to endure any tragedy. And I guess the thesis here is that people who thrive, they learn to merge. And let me just make a confession. I'm the worst. I'm as type A control freak. It has to go my way or I don't even like you kind of person in the room. And so we're kind of learning this together. You know, the, the moment that framed it for me, I was, every once in a while we get to do a series that is born of my own stuff. I mean, they're all born of my own stuff. It's just sometimes I find a book that perfectly answers it and I just plagiarize it. And other times it takes months of therapy and conversation and friendship to kind of work it out. This would be one of those. But the moment that most poignantly kind of helped me capture the tension was I was listening to an HBR podcast with a guy named uh, Peter Bregman. And, and he was asked a question and his response was, he said, I think we're going to talk more about some of his stuff next week when we talk about breathing, the part two of all this and the power of four seconds in your life. He said, I think the question we're all dealing with is this. When, when is it my job to change reality? And when is it my job to change myself to match reality? Now, if you could get that one right 100% of the time, wouldn't, wouldn't, it's like game over, right? Like 
problem solved, life figured out, like I took the blue pill, suddenly it is all not that blue pill, the other blue pill from the matrix. Let's not confuse the blue pills. <laughs> what colors were the matrix pills anyway? Were they blue and green? Blue and red. Which was the good one? See, I'm telling you. <laughs> Just. That's the question though, right? Like, when is it okay that the project's laid and as a leader, I go, okay, I can be the kind of leader who can deal with you not delivering on your promises. And when as a leader, do we go like, no, it has to be this way. When is it okay to let your kids do something that you wouldn't prefer that they do? And when do you have to go like, wait a minute, I can't control them. And when is a parent, when is good parenting to go, no way over my dead body, you're not going anywhere with him. Like that's the tension, isn't it? Like you're standing in an airport. When is it a waste of your energy to go, no, I'm sorry, ma'am, I'm not missing my flight. And when is it healthy to go, wait a minute, I, I, can't, I can't control United. Like that, that's the question, isn't it? Like how, how do we know when to do what? If, if we kind of just generally agree we need both, the question is like, where's the intersection? I guess that's the question that I'm asking. And this was my sincere question, is my sincere question. And I asked many of you and lots of friends and lots of contacts, like how, what, what's... Those two things collide over and over and over. And some of us are naturally willful people. And we have to learn to at times be surrendered. And some of us are naturally surrendered people. And if you were to go to therapy and you were to take Jesus seriously, you would learn sometimes you have to be willful. When? Where? How do we know where that is? And if that's not confusing enough, life is full of examples where we celebrate both sides, isn't it? Like some of you will be familiar with the name Derek Carr. Derek is the quarterback for a very terrible franchise. Just kidding. Uh, he, but he, he's, he's the only quarterback in the NFL who wears eyeliner and plays for, for the Oakland Raiders. Just, it's a joke. But does, have you ever, I've had people text me that, like, does he wear eyeliner? He kind of, you can't quite tell there. You, you, he, he's a stud. Derek Carr is one of the great up-and-coming quarterbacks in, in, in the league, it seems to me. Uh, but I don't want to talk about Derek Carr today, who was drafted in 2014 in the second round. I want to talk about Derek Carr when he was 11 years old. Because when Derek Carr was 11 years old, uh, his brother, David Carr, was the number one overall pick in the draft. Now, David Carr was the first pick, and you've maybe never been drafted in the NFL, but you've played dodgeball, and you know like when the first kid's taken, he's kind of a big deal. That, that was David Carr. Now, David Carr is not in the league anymore because he was drafted by the Texans, but when he was drafted first overall in the draft, Derek Carr was 11 years old. We have a picture. There's an entourage that comes with you when you get drafted first in the draft. They bring you up on the podium. You meet Commissioner Tagliabue. There's all kinds of glad handing and congratulations. You're on national TV. You don a jersey and a hat. You can, you can Google this, but there's a moment we're on film. I, it wasn't a high enough quality to show it to you. There's a moment where, where, where Derek Carr, the 11-year-old, while his brother's been drafted, shakes Commissioner Tagliabue's hand, and you can tell they exchange words. The question is, what does he say? He actually says four words. He's 11 years old. Like at a time when most of us on national TV, uh, like we're just quivering, right? You, you can tell they exchange four words. You, you know what he said? Four words. 11 years old, one of the most powerful men in, in American entertainment in the world is just shaking his hand, Paul Tagliabue. Derek Carr, as 11 years old, he was also a quarterback of his football team, mind you. He leaned forward. He said to Commissioner Tagliabue four words, I will be back. And he's not the Terminator. <laughs> I will. I mean, I mean, if you're 11, you're, you're peeing down your leg in that situation, right? <laughs> Derek Carr is going, I'll, 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 I'll be back. Like the moxie, the, the arrogance, the, the willfulness, right? And, and that to me only makes it more confusing because you know sometimes your willfulness contributes to your success because you're pretty good at getting what you want. And yet we also know that sometimes it's your detriment, isn't it? Let's take another story that I think contrasts this and to me makes it so complicated. In 1908, Henry Ford released his first Model T car. By 1914, 250,000 uh, automobiles were coming off the assembly lines in the United States every year. Now, that sounds pretty innocuous to us, but it wasn't to a certain class of people, especially that class of people who made their living and their family trade was involved in the horse and carriage business. Now, we think, like, what? That had to have been longer ago than that. By 19, in the 1900s, early 1900s, we, we know... 
that at minimum 110,000 people in the U.S. fed their families, fulfilled their purpose by making carriages, the wheels, and the harnesses for the carriage. Another 250,000 people, a quarter of a million people, made their living as blacksmiths, making horseshoes, putting them on the bottom of the horse's feet. Tens of thousands of people made their living sweeping manure from the city streets. Now, we're not even talking about those who raise the horses and raise the grain for the horses and the myriad things that go with it. But see, when by 1914, there were a quarter of a million automobiles entering the United States, uh, hitting the, the showroom floor, so to speak, every year, there was a problem because the horse and carriage business was dying. Now, some of those, some of those people involved in the industry, they dug their heels in. They were willful. They insisted that things must, they continued to make carriages and repair carriages and beat steel into the shape of a horseshoe. Others, they adapted. And in fact, what what business history tells us is those early adapters, they were quickly the beneficiaries of an industry that didn't just provide the country with a few hundred thousand jobs a year, but provided the country with millions of jobs a year. Those guys made a fortune. Why? Why? because they dug their heels in and insisted that things continue to go a certain way, because they stood there at Tagliabue and said, I'll be back. No, because then when they were 16, they found out they weren't good at football anymore, and they became good at biology. Like, that's the problem, isn't it? When, when, when which one? Do you, you, you with me? I, I guess I wish that if there were a formula, God would give it to me. I, 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 wish, I wish if there was a percentage... Someone would give it to me if there's a magic recipe. Like, where's the intersection? And that, at the risk of making it all about me, was, was the product of a couple months' worth of question asking. And finally, I got the chance to ask my friend Fred. Uh, and and some, of you, some of you know Fred, others not so much, and that's fine. But just by way of kind of context, Fred was a guy who I, I knew in Billings. I met him the day after I got serious about following Jesus at 19 years old. I went on a walk with him for an hour every other week uh, for 13 years until I moved here. Fred was a guy that you would love because he wasn't a pastor. Uh, he was an insurance agent. He was a businessman. He was a tennis coach. He was just like many of you. In fact, to try to understand narrate is probably better to understand Fred than maybe anybody else because it was just so kind of blue collar, kind of white collar vibe. And Fred, uh, I got the chance. We talk on the phone about once every, I don't know, two or three months now. And a couple of few months ago, I asked him, I said, Fred, okay, so here's my question. Here's what's driving me crazy. Here's what I think if I could figure this out, I'd be a better friend and a better parent and a better leader and a better husband and all those different things. Here, here's, here's my question, Fred. When is it my job to change reality? And how do I know it? And when is it my job to change myself to match reality? And here was his classic Fred statement. He said, Adam, without even really taking a breath, he said, Adam, go ahead, next slide. It's, it's about total engagement in the battle and complete detachment from the outcome. It's about being willful to the nth degree because that honors God in your plans, in your effort, in your calorie burning. And it's about simultaneously going, I can't control outcomes. Now, one example of this in the text is actually in in the life of a guy named Paul. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, who it was his job to take the message of Jesus to a a Gentile, non-Jewish world, The Apostle Paul, at the end of his life, found himself in prison, waiting to be tried before Caesar. His his death seemed imminent, and he wrote a letter to to one of his protégés, his heir apparent, if you will, this guy who was going to lead in his stead. His name was Timothy. We call it the book of 2 Timothy. And in this book, uh, and here's this one way to summarize 2 Timothy. In the book, you can read it yourself on your chair time this week. In the book, Paul gives himself an A for effort. He gives himself an A plus for engagement in the battle. And he actually gives himself a D minus for results. And it would be easy to read the book and conclude that he was depressed, but I don't think that's accurate. I think he's just being honest. Listen, uh, here towards the end, he says this, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. So Paul is going, I am willful and I won't apologize for it. I've given it my everything. And yet at this stage in his life, all the evidence around him 
is he failed. If you were to say to him, hey, Paul, in about 2,100 years, there'll be these people in, in, West, in the western, western part of the North American continent sitting in this little theater on a five-degree morning, and they'll be talking about this Jewish Messiah named Jesus. Paul would laugh at you. There was no evidence that that was going to happen. In fact, having given the final season of his life to talking to people about the opportunities for a life that withstands all storms in Jesus, he looked like a failure. Listen, listen to some of his statements. You just pick up on these. 115, you know that everyone in the province of Asia, Asia has deserted me, including a couple people who we don't name their kids that anymore. <laughs> listen to chapter four. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Uh, Crescens has, you just pretend like you know how you're reading them. It's, the pressure is more intense when you've been to seminary. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to, 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 to Dalmatia. So he's to the end of his life. Now, mind you, the, these geographically, these places he's pinpointing, he, he went through hell in those places. He, he was nearly stoned to death in those places. He was nearly murdered in those places. He, he lived there for years and talked about Jesus in those places. And now here he is at the very end going, nobody, nobody's listening. One more, and here he's referencing to a time he went before trial and Caesar. He says, at my first defense, no one came to support me, but everyone deserted me. So Paul, at the end of his life, seems to, in, in, in one breath, go, I was willful. I was engaged. I cared about that business, that organization, that marriage, those kids, that thing. I cared about it as much as I possibly could. And I had no control over the results. And you know what makes it even more complicated? No sooner did Paul's head roll, historically speaking, no sooner was he martyred by by the Roman authorities than did Christianity explode in Asia Minor, into Europe, and across into North America and the whole world. Paul seems to assess, I've given it my all, and I had no control. I said, okay, Fred, talk to me about this a little bit more. He said, Adam, my retirement, none of it's gone according to plan, and yet I'm way better off. Now, here's what he's referencing by way of little context. Fred's goal from his late 20s was to retire at 50. Part of the way he did that was uh, he forced himself to sell an insurance uh, policy every day, is my understanding. He, he, he made a lot of money. He lived very simply. He saved a lot of money. He gave a lot of money. He wanted to retire at 50 uh, so that he could open up an office and talk to people and his friends about Jesus and marriage and life without charging them anything. He's not a pastor. I think last time we talked, he met with something like 3,000 people last quarter. So he's doing it. So that was his goal. He retired before the boom collapsed. He said, Adam, when when I sat down with my financial advisor, uh, he suggested that we build the the future of my retirement and those incomes that I'd saved, that resource I'd saved, that we build it, that we assume a 10% return on my investment. He said, I wouldn't, that was too aggressive for me. So I I pushed back and we planned on 8%. Now, maybe like me, like, like, I w- those numbers were completely lost on me. And I was like, I don't get it. He laughed. He said, Adam, th- there's not a person in the country that's gotten better than 5% over that same span of time. He said, but here's the deal. I'm better off. I was fully engaged, cared deeply, parented the best I could, worked that business as hard as I could, invested in that marriage as much as I possibly could. And yet I simultaneously constantly remind myself, I don't get to control outcomes. You see how similar the stories are? I was meeting with a guy this week who, who was sharing that later in his life, not long after getting married, his parents divorced. He said it was, it was devastating to him, and he couldn't figure out why it was so devastating. And then finally he figured out it was devastating to him because he realized if that could happen to his dad, it could happen to him. And then he said he just had to simply, it took him a while to get to the point of, of going like, oh, I'm right. It could happen to me. And there's nothing I can do to guarantee that it won't. Proverbs says it this way. In chapter 21, we actually looked at it on Christmas Eve, but I think it's a verse worth your considering memorizing because it so grabs this. It says, The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but victory rests with the Lord. I guess the question I'm asking is, what if? 
what if, what if you could live this way? What if you could care just as much about your son or daughter, just as much about your business, just as much about that trip? What, what if you could plan just as studiously as you currently do, your grades, making the team, whatever it is, and at the same time, constantly remind yourself you can't control the outcome. You can contribute. You can work hard. You can be studious. You don't get to determine the outcome. A C- couple of my heroes are a guy named John Ortberg and Dallas Willard. And John, in a book called Shadow Missions, tells a story of a time where Dallas had spoke at his church. And Dallas uh, was a professor at University of Southern California and also one one of the more profound theologians of the 20th century. So Dallas had spoke at his church. He said they were walking out of the church. Dallas had to get to his car quick because he had to catch a flight. And they were walking towards the car. And John said he realized that Dallas wasn't asking the question that all communicators ask in this walk. And that was simply, like, how how did it go? How did I do and he said, he, 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 what he knows, because John Ortberg is also a communicator, he, he knows that the, the, the game is, if it went really well, you feel really good. If it went really poorly, you feel really bad. He said, Dallas wasn't even asking the question. He said, in fact, and, and the way he said it was he, was, he was humming this hymn to himself, and he wasn't even doing it well. He said, then it realized, he realized Dallas was living out something that he had taught him for years. He said, Dallas worked very hard on the message, cared deeply about its impact. And as he walked off the stage, and I love the image John Ortberg used, he said as he walked off the stage, he let go of the results like a helium balloon. Gone. Not of his control. As I was talking to Fred, he said, he said Adam, I don't mean to sound arrogant, and he's not, though it may make him sound pretentious. But he said, someone asked me this week, he said, Fred, you seem to be the most content person I know. What's your secret? And he, he just laughed. And he laughed because the fact here I was asking the same question more or less. And he said, Adam, it's, it's, it's real simple. Or excuse me, he said to this woman, it's real simple. I work really hard. And I work just as hard to make sure that I'm not owning results. Constantly reminding myself I don't get to control results. What, 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 what if you could do this? I mean, what, what if... Whatever, whatever it is, and you know what it is, whether it's your marriage or your kids, whether it's your health. I mean, you catch yourself, right, and you're watching a commercial, and suddenly you're like, oh, no, what if a piano falls out of the sky and falls on my head? Turns out you can't control that. Like, what, what if all those things that prey upon you to be fearful of things over which you had no control, what, what if you made a conscious decision to go, no, I can't control that? And when Jesus said, hey, tell you what, why don't you not worry about tomorrow? Because it's got enough going on. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to live that. What, what if? Like, can, can you imagine what would happen? Can you imagine what would happen to your level of anxiety if you could suddenly differentiate in the moment, I can control this, I can't control this. I can work hard on this, I have no control. Can you imagine what might happen to the type of friend you are? If you were better at differentiating as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a boss, as a co-leader, as a friend, what things you can control and what things you can't? Can, can, Can you imagine what might happen to your emotional health? Can you imagine how much more real God might become to you? If you actually believed that a large percentage of your life you had no control over and somehow he did and you were just gonna trust him with that. Listen, I I think to the degree to which this merge thing sits in all of us as a real, honest, perturbing question. Maybe it's because the one thing we've really not reconciled is the difference between things we can and cannot control. Listen, if you're someone here and this idea of Jesus is new to you and you're not really looking for religion, the good news is either are we. But the invitation of Jesus is to believe in him, to follow him, to find his grace, and to have a whole new life made available to you. And listen, we we believe strongly that you're not born a Christian, that that's a decision. We also think that that decision is best made in the context of relationship. And so if we can help you with that, we would love to do that. But for the rest of us, for all of us, let's, let's, let's just practice. What's the thing? And where do you get to invest effort? Where do you get to honor God 
by being willful. And where, maybe starting now and continuing into a chair tomorrow morning as you start slow, where do you need to invite God to pry your white knuckles open and begin to step into the vulnerability of you? You have no control over that. You have any control over how long you're going to live and how you're going to die. You have no control over whether or not she's going to love you in 10 years. You have no control over whether or not an earthquake's going to hit and we're all going to suddenly disappear. You have no control. And therefore, you give it to him. Next week, we're going to talk about what four seconds can do in helping us identify those moments where we've got to let go. Let's, let's pray. God, Lord, I, this is so much easier to talk about than it is to do. God, as we make sense of a broken marriage, as we make sense of a broken heart over our adult kids, as we try to understand what we can do within a diagnosis, as we cope with tragedy, as we deal with the embarrassment of a failing business. God, as we just deal with anxiety and sleeplessness. Lord, we confess to you that we are vulnerable. That nothing's really changed from the garden. That we we stand naked in this world with control over, over almost nothing. God, for those of us who have already made a decision to trust you, would you increase our faith, please? For those of us sincerely looking for answers, God, we trust you to come alongside. Jesus, we love you. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.